Today's video is brought to you by the Modern Gun School. This is an accredited online university. Whether you're looking to learn a few things or trying to break into a career in the firearms industry, this place is set up to be streamlined and work for you so that you don't have to burn a large quantity of money to get a an education in the firearms arts. And that gives you some latitude to pursue other educational pursuits like, oh, I don't know, a business degree on top of your firearms education. So go check them out at Modern Gun School and tell them that I sent you. Let's get into today's video. Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Thanks for tuning in. You're watching the VSO Gun Channel. It's great to be here as always. And uh, real quick, you guys might hear some wind. It is super windy outside. I mean, the dog's losing his mind. He hasn't left his box in like an hour, but he's afraid of rain. So that's kind of like par for the course. I try my best to sound design, but contrary to what you've been told, humans do not have the power to control the weather. That's a discussion for another day. I don't typically wade into the heavy military weapons thing because uh, most of what we talk about here is the man portable stuff, small arms fire, stuff like that. Uh, that's usually what we're talking about when we're talking about the Second Amendment. However, in that context, as an American citizen, I do believe that you have a birthright to an intercontinental ballistic missile with a nuclear warhead. That's a discussion for another day. The Trump battleship. And as a naval buff, I don't think that this technically classifies as a battleship. But we currently don't have any battleships in the United States fleet. So I suppose that they can write, rewrite the rules to a modern context and make it whatever it is. Because we currently don't have. And it's going to be a new class and all that sort of stuff anyway. Semantics. Okay. He likes the term battleship. We're going with battleship. Again, new toy. Cool. Uh, but the thing that I think is the most important and most interesting here is right here at the front. Railguns. I think this has huge implications for modern weaponry going forward. And you might ask, okay, Kurt, well, I'm not a super duper gun person. What is the railgun? Well, if you think of any typical projectile weapon that is not a rocket or a missile... What we're talking about is some kind of impetus, some kind of force that forces a projectile down a tube called a barrel, and then that projectile flies downrange, and it has predictable ballistics based on all the things that you think of when you, you shoot a rifle or something like that. Gravity, Coriolis effect, spin drift, you know, all that sort of stuff. And it has been used for much of what I would say modern warfare history, we, we kind of got away from the big heavy guns measured in inches, <laughs> tens of inches, um, like 16 inch guns, you know, that you put your whole freaking head in. Uh, we got away from those in the age of the missile Navy. So much of military doctrine today is built around missiles. And, um, Missiles have some problems. We'll get back to that here in a second. But what is a rail gun? Well, usually what we talk about when we're talking about those guns is some kind of explosive propellant that is burned and it launches that thing. Sorry about that. My bad. A rail gun uses high powered alternating magnets to achieve the same effect. But the difference here is that there is sort of a limit to how much you can burn in a barrel to ob ob obtain speed. And there's ultimately a theoretical limit and the empirical limit of how fast you can make a projectile go with explosive propellants in a single... Th there's a limit to that. And um, that limits its range and explosive power and kinetic energy and all that sort of stuff, right? Um, on top of that, the explosion disrupting any kind of... Uh, ability to uh, put advanced targeting munitions in the in the guns like there there are several complications in the in the what we would call the modern era of, uh, of precision munitions that might be problematic if you're talking about a traditional like 16 inch gun or something like that that you would see on uh, like a World War II battleship. 
a railgun solves many of those problems by using those alternating magnets, and they are immensely powerful. We're talking about speeds well in excess of what a traditional powder munition would be able to achieve. They would easily be classified as hypersonic munitions, okay? Just, just throwing that out there. And part of that is it's a kinetic energy weapon. You could technically put uh, guided munitions in it uh, with a little bit more development, but generally speaking, what we're talking about is take that really heavy dart and make it go super fast and make it punch through stuff. Earlier, I mentioned that much of the United States military's arsenal is built around missiles and rockets, and missiles and rockets have a, sort of a distinct advantage when it comes to that uh, precision guidance and stuff like that because it doesn't have to start out going wicked fast. They can get to wicked fast because they speed up or have at least the capacity to speed up as they fly versus when we talk about gun rounds, they're as fast as they're ever going to get when they leave the muzzle. And so that initial speed, that initial velocity is really important. And when you place some kind of physical limit on it by the powder burning munitions to to get there well you've set your your limits artificially lower than the capability of a missile when you are talking about something that starts out hypersonic well you've leveled the playing field a little bit now when it comes to missiles and what we're talking about here which is railgun rounds railguns offer a distinct advantage when it comes to Cost and space. Missiles take up a whole lot of space. Railgun rounds, in theory, if you were talking about storing them and uh, and and providing these mission these munitions on site so that they could be shot, take up considerably less space and they are substantially cheaper. We're talking about just ballpark numbers, we're talking about tens of thousands of dollars for railgun rounds, millions of dollars for missiles per shot. So you can literally shoot hundreds of railgun rounds per missile. So there's a big advantage there. The other thing about that is missiles, if they aren't used, they expire. And this is one of the reasons that we trade a lot of our stock to various nations around the world because sometimes we just don't shoot all of our stuff before the expiration date and they constantly are making more missiles and the, the kind of like engineered obsolescence thing also keeps the, the evil military industrial complex running because you're constantly going to need more missiles versus like once a railgun dart still a railgun dart. It's just a solid chunk of metal, man. Not to belabor the point or anything or get super in the weeds, but if we're talking about loading cruise missiles, like refitting a ship's arsenal for combat, if we're talking about reloading missiles onto a ship, well, those require specialized cranes in a port. Railgun munitions would not be that way. You could load them with a supply ship. You wouldn't have to actually take the ship back to a specialized port to reload those munitions. So when we're talking about the thought process of like the next major peer-to-peer -peer conflict, again, not to get super in the weeds, what happens when you run out of missiles and you got a whole lot of drones that you got to shoot down. Maybe a railgun is a pretty good thing. I mean, we do have like the Sea Whiz and stuff like that. Don't get me wrong. But like when we're talking about interception of, of cruise missiles, ship to ship missiles, stuff like that, then having a hypersonic railgun might be the ticket, especially when we're talking about shooting lots and lots of times. Now, the downside to railguns is like all guns, metal to metal contact, barrels wear out, things like that. But when you're talking about this, in my mind, what I think is like, what's a railgun barrel cost compared to how many missiles you can shoot? And I think that probably there's some margin in there for those spare barrels. The question is, how complicated are they to change? You know, that sort of stuff. I would assume that what they would probably do 
is when those things are ready for refit. You probably roll in, you probably pull the whole damn turret and and drop a new rail gun into space so that the thing can be repaired because it's probably going to need specialized uh, maintenance on those things, I would think, anyway. Regardless, let's bring this back to the discussion that I wanted to have today, which is whenever we do something like this, whenever a technology like this is integrated, innovation usually stems from that. So once they finally get the first operational military grade railguns, because they've already made these things, right? Um, the, the, the railgun project was immensely successful. Um, it just did not have a home really because it, it didn't time up with the, the, the production schedule of various other vessels that were slated to possibly get one. Whenever you integrate a weapon system like this, future iterations of that thing are going to make it better. Fielding it is going to yield a whole lot of things that just testing it at like the general dynamics test range isn't going, it's like the whole, um, the, the great idea from the engineer. I mean, you've all taken apart like a Japanese car, right? It's like, wow, this looks really great on paper, but then they execute it. And it's like, God, who came up with this idea? This was clearly a blueprint drawn by an engineer and not a mechanic. There are things like that are going to happen once it gets integrated as a, as a real weapon system. And what that means for us, because I mean, while I do agree with your uh, birthright to own a Trump class battleship, it's, it's probably going to be a little bit out of your price range. Okay. It's just, just bearer of bad news. Very few people in the world are going to be able to afford one. So when it comes to the railgun technology, sorry, I just whacked it again. I'm being really bouncy today. Um, shrinking that technology down to something that is more small light vehicle small vehicle compatible down to man portable type stuff that's this is the first step in the direction of eventually getting to those types of things and then when that happens that's i think the logical projection or progression excuse me towards once you've got rail guns and the rail guns are out competing the the powder burning munitions out there and you start playing with the power systems where you've shrunken the power systems down to be able to produce the massive amount of energy required to alternate those electromagnets at a rate to be able to achieve hyper velocities well now we're starting to talk about direct energy weapons and that competition, I think, is what ultimately will spur us into, like, the plasma rifles and stuff like that. Now, will I see that in my lifetime? I don't know. I mean, in my lifetime, we were using f real floppy disks. So who knows where we're going to be, right? I had a Razor flip phone when I was in college, for crying out loud. And then, um, you know, as far as technology is concerned, have you guys seen the graph where it's, like, phone size and it goes down like this? And then... Like the race to the bottom was get the phone as tiny as possible, less intrusive as possible. And then there's a point, an inflection point where it goes the opposite direction. And it's like figured out we can watch corn on our phones. And then the screen size gradually grew to the point where I cannot fit this in my pocket and get into my truck. I have to put it in my, my left pocket to be able to raise my leg high enough to get onto the running board. So what I'm saying here is the concept of innovation starts with something like this and 50 years from now we may not recognize small arms munitions based on the decision to finally go for something like this out of a necessity for the next peer-to-peer -peer conflict being able to shoot down more stuff and not go bankrupt anyway i want to know what you guys think about this in the comment section down below i think this is fascinating stuff and hopefully we'll see you on another video here at the VSO Gun Channel. Also, one more thing I wanted to include here while we're at the credits is this is just a concept art that we're seeing right now. This is just an announcement by the Department of War. Uh, there's no allocation for this currently from Congress, 
any of that sort of stuff. This is just currently in the, hey, this is where we're wanting to go phase. I'll update you as we get more information. 